Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and welcome to part three of our review slash overview for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. In our last video, we went over character creation, creating our character Jack Miller. So now we get to use him as we explore tasks and skill mechanics. We're not going to go over combat just yet, that's going to be its own video later on, but in order to understand combat, we first need to know how skill checks work. Or at least how I do skill mechanics, since I'm going to be mentioning a few house rules and various things that I do that might differ a bit from the core book, and I'll point those out when I have those differences. Skill checks are made whenever your character wishes to perform some sort of action. However, simple and mundane actions, those don't require that you have to make a skill roll for them. Essentially what he's saying is you don't need to roll a drive skill check every single time your character drives to the store in order to buy some milk. That's a pretty mundane thing right there. Same thing like if a character decides to get on Google and look up cat videos. There's no computer role required to look up cat videos. That's pretty mundane. And a hell of a lot of fun. However, some simple tasks still require that a character have the basic training in it, meaning that they've got a zero in that skill in order to do that as a mundane task. For example, you know, driving a car or piloting a ship under normal circumstances, that is mundane, providing you even know how to drive or pilot. So with those simple tasks that require that you at least have a basic training in order to do them, I'd require a roll if the character lacks the skill altogether, which also means that they're going to be subjected to the untrained skill penalty. So skill rolls should only be made if there's some sort of variable involved, such as they're in danger, or if they're trying to rush the job, or if they're trying to do something that's just normally pretty difficult to do, or if there is some sort of consequence if they fail. Now that consequence could be that it's just exciting or funny or something like that. It doesn't always have to be life or death. How we do this is we just roll 2d6 and total the result together. An average skill check requires that that result be an 8 or higher. And we get this handy chart showing the various difficulty levels involved. Each task requires some amount of time in order to accomplish it, ranging from a few seconds to a few days, depending on whatever that task is. Again, we get this handy little chart showing the different time frame increments. A player can increase or decrease the difficulty of an action by increasing or decreasing the standard time to perform that action. For example, searching an arrow thoroughly takes 1d6 times 10 minutes, and that's difficulty 8. But if we rush the job, we can do it in 1d6 minutes, but the difficulty is increased one rank and up to 10. Or we could take our time doing the job, spending 1 die 6 hours, but lowering our difficulty to 6. However much we roll above or below that target number is what we call the effect. So if we miss a roll by 2, our effect is negative 2. Or if we beat a roll by 3, our effect is then 3. Or if we hit that number on the nose, then our effect is 0. And we get this chart that explains what the effect level means. But some skills, the effect number is very important. Such as first aid, for example, the effect reflects how many points of damage are healed by a first aid roll. An effect of minus 6 is a critical failure, while a positive effect of 6 is an exceptional success. For my game, I also added that a natural 2, meaning that you rolled 2d6 and they both came up 1, that is always a failure. Snake eyes! But it's not necessarily a critical failure unless the effect of that was also a minus 6 or less. For characteristic checks, like an intellect check to solve a puzzle or a strength check to open a stuck door, you simply roll 2d6 and add the dice modifier next to that stat. So with Jack, we roll 2d6 plus 1 to any intellect checks, or 2d6 plus 0 to any strength checks, because his strength is average, really on the below side of average. And if we want to do a dex check, he is a minus 1 due to his terrible dexterity. Skill checks work much the same way. So if Jack wanted to perform a carouse check, which is the skill of socializing and having fun, he has a 1 in that skill, meaning that we add 1 to our skill roll. But we also add a characteristic die modifier to any skill checks made, and which stat we use for that characteristic modifier just depends on what it is we want to do with the skill. For example, with Carouse, if we wanted to drink someone under the table, that's our Carouse plus our Endurance modifier that's added to the roll, giving us a total of plus two. If we wanted to gather rumors at a party, that's our Carouse level of one plus our Social modifier, which is zero, meaning that we only get a plus one to the skill check. Or if we wanted to see who's standing out awkwardly at the party, that's our carouse level, 1, plus our intellect die modifier of 1, giving us a total of plus 2 to this roll. 
So each skill roll is always linked to a characteristic, but the specific characteristic is just depending on what it is that they're trying to do with their skills. Such as firing a gun. That's my gun skill plus my dexterity modifier in order to shoot it. But if I wanted to take this gun and take it a paw to possibly repair it, then that would be my gun skill plus my education modifier. Each skill description gives us examples of not just ways the particular skill can be used, but which stats and times are associated with that particular task. Now one thing I want to mention is that when it comes to deciding which characteristic to use for a particular role, there is going to be some overlap. For example, under Persuade, if I wanted to bluff my way past a guard, I might do it with my intellect, meaning that I'm outsmarting this guard, talking circles around him. Or I could use my social to do it, basically saying, do you know who I am? I'm supposed to be here. Get out of my way. And in these cases of either or, the player gets to decide which characteristic it is that they want to do to achieve their goal. The most significant overlap comes between intellect and education. One of those is raw cleverness and smarts, while the other one is training and education. And some of those skill checks could go either way as far as which one they use. However, some game masters might find it confusing when making the call if a skill check should be based off of intellect or should they base it off of education, or could this be either? So for those, game masters, just simply ask yourself, is this task something that could only be done by a character's education and training and know how to do it? If so, then it's probably going to be education. Or, is this something that is alien and weird and there is no way anybody could have trained for this one before? If so, it's probably going to be intellect. There are a lot of tasks that can only be completed if a character has been trained and knows how to do it. And, there's a lot of tasks that a character is only going to be able to get through it if they are smart enough to figure it out. And, there's going to be a lot of tasks that kind of could go either way. Oppose skills. Now, some skills do not have a target number, such as sneaking past a guard pits their recon skill against your stealth. For opposed skill rolls, you simply roll the appropriate skill check for each character, add all the dice modifiers involved, and the highest score wins. Test chains. Test chains are when a series of different skill checks are performed to achieve a specific result. For example, selling a cargo of stolen goods requires a streetwise check in order to find a fence, and then a broker skill check in order to negotiate a good price for those goods. But the quality of the fence is going to alter the quality of the price that the fence is going to offer for those stolen goods. So for that we have task chains, where the effect of one role in a chain affects what the next role is going to have. This is a great way of encouraging your players and your group to sort of work together in order to achieve some sort of common goal, hopefully by helping each other out. So after the first roll is complete, you consult this chart. So if the first roll failed with an effect of minus two to minus five, the second roll suffers a minus two dice modifier. Now if the first roll succeeded with an effect of one through five, it gives a plus one dice modifier to the second roll, meaning you helped them out. We showed a few of those off in our Mystery of BTSHT365 Game Diary. And in that, our sensor operator kept trying to do a census check in order to find the safest course for our pilot to fly. But then he would fail that census check so badly that it actually made it harder for the pilot to do it. Multiple tasks. Sometimes a character might attempt to do two tasks at the exact same time, such as firing a gun while driving a car, or climbing a wall as they're simultaneously trying to sneak past a guard. For those, you simply raise the difficulty category for both tasks. But there's a house rule that I have, which is something that I employ and I completely stole from playing Call of Cthulhu, and that's if a character is attempting two tasks at the exact same time, they roll one time, and then they just apply those dice results to their specific modifiers to see if they made those checks. Now maybe that one roll succeeds in both, and great, we can move forward. Or it might fail in both, or once you apply all the specific dice modifiers and characteristics and whatnot, not, they might make one and fail the other. But my reasoning why I just make them roll once is if a character is trying to do just one action, even if it's going to be a combined action, requiring that player to roll multiple times is really just increasing their overall chance of failure versus just making them roll one time and seeing if either one or both of them succeed or fail. Next, while characters may have several dice modifiers in play for skill levels or characteristics, or maybe they have some particularly good or bad equipment that they're trying to do this task with, or there could be sorts of other things that are covered within the rules themselves. But sometimes, 
often, the characters are going to find themselves in some sort of situation where they should be getting a plus or a penalty to whatever they're trying to do, but there really isn't any specific rule in the rule book that covers that, such as hanging upside down while trying to fire a weapon. There should be some sort of minus to that, but the rule book doesn't give us anything as far as that situation, as far as what the dice modifier is. Or maybe the ship's engineer is having somebody who's not trained helping them out, but you know, they're basically there holding the flashlight and fetching their tools. It should give some sort of plus, but the rule book doesn't really cover like what sort of plus that should give them. So for those, we use boons and bans. Now how these work is a player rolls 3d6 instead of 2. If it's a boon, they take the highest. If it's a bane, they take the lowest. You can only have one boon or one bane per roll, and they do cancel each other out on a one-for-one -one basis, so if you have two boons, you only get to roll one boon. Or if you've got two boons and one bane, you still get to roll one boon because one of those boons canceled out the bane, leaving one boon left, but you only get to have one at the time that you roll it. And I admit, I'm not really the best about remembering to apply boon dice when I really should. Yeah, you players have kind of noticed that one too. When it comes to skills, I do have a few criticisms. Well, that's probably a harsh word for it. I'm going to call them personal hurdles. For me, some of the skills don't feel all that intuitive as far as which skills should be used when a player asks, what do I need in a role? For example, something like palming a credit chip. I would assume that would be done by a stealth role or possibly a streetwise role. However, the rules say that's a deception check. Now, once I thought about it, palming items is a staple for illusionists, and what is illusion magic if not just really great deception? So it does make sense, but it's not what my instincts first told me. Next, some interpersonal tasks or most interpersonal tasks could actually be done with multiple skills, such as deception allows you to convince your way past a guard with no ID. But then bluffing your way past a guard is done with a persuade, which is extremely similar. I mean, it's not the exact same situation, but it's still close enough to have some overlap a lot of the time. So the question becomes when you're running a game, which one do you use for this particular situation? And the answer is which have a skill that's best for this situation. And honestly, it could be multiple skills. It's kind of like how we had mentioned earlier that certain skill checks could use multiple types of characteristics in order to get whatever result it is that the players want. It's just like that. But with this, multiple skills could be used to achieve whatever result it is that the player wants. So instead of just looking at your play and say, hey, give me an eight difficulty on this skill and that's how you're going to get the results that you want, just look at them and say, hey, Based off of your character's skill set and experience, how would they try to solve this problem? And your player could look over their character sheet and say, hey, I want to try using this skill out and this is how I'm going to do it. And it's your job as a referee to look at that, think about it, weigh it. And if it's good, say, yeah, I'll go with that. Now, one dedicated skill that appears at first to be missing from the skill set altogether, and I really wish the system did have one, or at least when I first read it, I was like, man, the game really needs this, is the ability to read someone else's intent. You know, basically tell if an NPC is lying to you, or maybe tell if that NPC is kind of getting ready to pull out a gun or pull out a knife and try to kill you. A lot of other games have a skill that does this, and they call it all sorts of different stuff. You know, sense motive, insight, uh, human perception, psychology, all pretty much mean roughly the same thing. Uh, but Traveler doesn't have a skill that does that, and it's a skill that we use all the time. My players and I really enjoy it, and it's something that's just kind of become a standard thing with our games together. But after searching through a bunch of modules and asking around on the forums, I found the answer, and again, it's that it completely depends on what the situation is at the time. It might be recon, for example, which is sensing and analyzing threats. So if someone was about to attack you, recon works well for that because it would be able to sense those hidden clues that they're about to pull out that shiv and try to shiv you. But it might also be the Traveler's own deception check when trying to figure out if somebody is lying to you, meaning that it takes a liar to spot a liar. Or it might even be streetwise if it's in a situation that's kind of streetwisey. In a courtroom setting, it might be done with advocate. Again, the trick is just to read the situation and the circumstances at the time the traveler is attempting to do a skill roll, and then ask the player, based off of their character's background, how they would go about trying to solve this problem and achieving those results. And I admit, this one has been a personal hurdle for me and my players, because instead of there just be like one skill that does this one thing, and there's just 
just a pretty easy way of doing it. Instead, there are lots of ways of trying to accomplish a particular goal where different skills could do it a lot of different ways. And now the player gets to kind of role play like, well, if I want to achieve it this way, this is how I use this other skill in order to do that other thing that skill could do, but I don't have that skill or I can't do that skill as well. So in a lot of ways, Traveler has uh, got a very kind of loose and easy to define rule system, but at the same time, it's got a very complicated and crunchy rule system, and it's got those at the same time. Now, some games do try to find a good mix between those two, but it doesn't usually work that well. But with Traveler, it actually has worked very well for us, where we've got a lot of crunch in some ways, and a lot of kind of loose and open for interpretation in others. Which is actually pretty cool, because it means that the characters can do a lot of different things with the skills that they have, rather than being tied down to a very narrow definition as to what each skill can do. However, this is one of those areas where our experience playing a lot of different role-playing games sort of worked against us, just because we were used to a very different way of doing this. Finally, let's look at skill improvements. How we increase the skills that we have or gain new skills that we don't have. Improving a skill is done through study. And to increase or gain a skill, a character has to dedicate eight weeks worth of study time, or a study period as they call it. Now that doesn't mean it has to be eight straight weeks back to back. Uh, they can do a week here or a week there after you know some period of time like that. But each week itself has to be a solid full uh, eight hours a day week. Now I'm assuming they get weekends off for that, so probably just five days a week instead of seven, but that's just my call. That ain't too big of an issue when you consider that jump space takes a full week for you to get through it. And there ain't much else to do while you're stuck in your starship that's in jump space. So if you're in a game where your characters are making lots and lots of jumps, they're going to have plenty of time to get all the training and reading out of the way. It's kind of like those truck drivers, you know, that listen to audiobooks while they're doing their big cross-country hauls. That is a seriously well-read group of people right there. Once you've completed a full study period, the full eight weeks, over however long that really did take you to do, you then make an education skill roll, meaning you roll 2d6, add your education modifier, and if you get an eight or higher, you completed that study period. Congratulations! The exception to this is going to be athletics. For those, you roll the appropriate skill of the athletics you're trying to do, whether that be dex, strength, or endurance. And how many study periods you have to complete in order to raise a skill really just depends on what level of skill you're trying to get. To get a zero, you just need to do one. Then to raise it from zero to one just requires one more. And then up to second level requires two more after that, three more for third, four for fourth, etc., etc. You get the idea. There's a section on the character sheet where players can track how many study periods they've completed for a particular skill. So with our Jack character, if we wanted to raise his recon from a 2 to a 3, we just note it in this box and track his weeks studied for each 8-week study period. And then once those complete, we then roll our education check using the plus 1 education dice modifier. And once we have 3 completed study periods, we get 3rd level recon. Holy crap! Even providing that I made all those education rolls, Three study periods comes to 24 weeks that I'm studying to learn a skill, and that is a seriously long time. Personally, I think that learning recon in the field with my experience would be a better teacher than just sitting in my bunk reading about it. I agree. While I really do like that there is some sort of mechanic for uh, learning skills or improving skills through education and taking time to basically go to school, I personally prefer a method of awarding experience to my players uh, as a way for to encourage them to use the skills that they have, basically they get a reward for that, or to be able to reward my players for really good role-playing. Which is why for our game, I use an optional rule from the Traveler Companion. In it is an experience point mechanic, and how that works is every session I give the players one XP for every four hours of game time that we had. Since our sessions run about eight hours, that usually comes to two XPs a session. The players then must immediately assign which skill or which stat they want their points to go to. And they can split them up, one here, one there, or put them both on the same one. Doesn't matter, and it's completely their choice. But they can't save them in a general pool where they're going to cash that in later. They have to immediately assign where they're going to put those XPs. But I insist that that experience point can only be put in some sort of stat or skill that the character used on that particular session, or that they trained in. They can't just put the XP on some 
stat their skill that they haven't used at all this adventure. They only get to use them on the ones that they actually used. Additionally, I may assign some sort of dedicated experience point to one particular stat or skill that the player used exceptionally well or uh, in a memorable way on that adventure. Uh, and they get to put that there, so it's kind of like a bonus XP, but I'm the one who gets to decide where that goes as sort of a bonus award for good playing. The book gives us these charts that show how many XPs are required to advance a level in skills or stats. Not social though, you can't raise social through XPs, that's only raised through role playing. That's just a much better system for skill improvement for our game, so I really do recommend it for any of the game masters out there. Okay, that is about it. There's only a couple other things they haven't mentioned. Uh, for example, Jack of All Trades. You can't be raised under either method you do. Uh, Jack of All Trades can only be acquired or raised during the course of character creation itself. Also, there is a maximum number of skill levels that any particular character can have, and that is their intellect plus their education multiplied by three. So in our case, that comes to 66, and totaling all our skills up comes to only 15, so we still have a long way to go with this character before we reach that threshold. And finally, on simple characteristic checks, such as a strength check to hold a stock door, or a dex check to walk a narrow beam, or an endurance check if they're doing a kind of a long march, while those don't require having the athletics check in order to do those, if the character has the athletics ability as well, I would go ahead and give them their skill level in that. But I'm not going to require that all players have to roll that because some of them might not have athletics and then they get the penalty. So even for characteristic checks in those situations, if it's simple, if they do have athletics, I go ahead and give them the athletic skill level because, you know, that's what it's for. Anyway, that is it for this episode. Hopefully some of you out there found this helpful. The next one in the series, if everything goes according to plan, is going to be covering combat and healing. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of this series or some of our other stuff, such as game reviews and how to's, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day. You know, the character that's spending the time on a starship practicing their explosives or their heavy weapons skills, they're going to be the one that wins the most likely to get spaced by that crewmate's award. Providing, of course, the crewmates survive that practicing.